Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning, family. My name is Alice, and I'm a grateful member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I'm really grateful that you guys showed up. I thought I'd be here maybe by myself, um, and so I'm really glad that you guys are here. So um, first, I want to start with uh, some thanks. I think that we we say in passing, you know, thank you for the people who are leading the meeting. Thank you for the people that do service. But I want to I want to open by giving some real gratitude. There were people when I got here, my sobriety date is May 21st, 1987, and they'd open the room and they'd make coffee and they'd set chairs up and they'd spread out literature. And those little things created a sense of welcome. And that sense of welcome helped me find a sense of belonging. And that sense of belonging helped me find God and God saved my life. So to everybody that showed up at the business meeting that we had um, for the Bronx Big Book, it's always the last Sunday of the month now, and stayed after the nine o'clock and made a service commitment, God bless you. For Stacy, who said, I'll do that, before Matt got the question out of his mouth, thank you. Um, for Matt, who at four years sober, I'm 33 years sober, is a spiritual leader for me. Thank you, Matt. And I hope you have a fantastic time today with your family apple picking. Um, for George, who's the treasurer, right? For, for Darren, who's watching the door, like, Ordinary people do ordinary things and they create an extraordinary experience. And the question is, are you willing to do an ordinary thing to create an ordinary experience for an extraordinary outcome for somebody? So thank you, thank you, thank you. I wanna do a pitch about the seventh tradition before I, I go into my story. So, you know, we always say we love this meeting. Oh, I love this meeting, I love this meeting. Newsflash. Love is a verb. Love is an action word. And if you can't put a buck in the basket, don't put it in. But if you've got a buck, put it in the basket. Because we're a meeting of 120 to 150 people at night. And if everybody put a dollar in at the end of the month, the level of support that we could give world service would make all of us proud. So love is a verb. And for those of you that have gotten something out of this and this program has saved your life, give back what was so freely given. So, okay, I think that's it for my soapbox stuff. Um, I want to give a couple warnings before I start talking. One is that I cuss. And the God of my understanding doesn't care. The God of my understanding doesn't give a fuck. So if you're offended, I'm really, really sorry. That is not my intent. The big book tells me I'm working with others to use plain language, and that's what I'm going to use. When you hear my story, you'll understand why that's plain language to me. I didn't pick that up out in the streets. I picked it up at home. The other thing I'm going to say is that, you know, I didn't want to do this. You know, Matt texted me and said, did you hear? And I'm like, no, what? And then he sent me the flyer. You know, and I sat on it a couple days and then I, I, I hit him and I was like, dude, you should do it. Like people want to hear you, you should do it. And he's like, no, nah, I got other plans, it's you. And I don't, I, I like the back, you know, I like booking. I like, you know, I'll type up an agenda for you. I'll do a flyer. Like I, I, I like that, I like the back. And I like the back because after 33 years, I'm not always sure, sure I have something to say, right? And so let's see today. The thing I do know about AA is that if I mumble, y'all are going to be like, oh, my God, that was so great. And so, uh, you know what I mean? Y'all are not a good gauge of what's good and not because you love me and I love you back. So here's my other warning. I'm going to say God a lot. And it's the God of my understanding. I'm not promoting Christianity. I'm not. I just don't know another way, really, to easily say this extraordinary, amazing power in my life. And so I use God. So I I, I want you, 
if in any way that rubs you wrong, to take Ebby's advice that he gave to Bill while Bill was drunk and he wasn't. He said, find a God of your own understanding. Find a God of your own concept. So I'm only using God because it's the way that I talk about the power, the creator, the spirit of the universe in my life. The third thing is that when they wrote the, the forward to the, the, the book, they said that 50% of the people who came in got struck sober. Another 25% got sober after some relapses. I don't know what number some is. And then the other 25%, and these are of the people who came and really tried, kind of got better, but maybe didn't get sober. That's a 75% success rate. The data now is 6%, 8%, I don't know, 10%. And I think it's because we're not doing what they did. We're talking about stuff that's not in the book, 90 meetings in 90 days keep coming back. Don't drink no matter what, put the plug. That's not, the book doesn't say any of that. So my job is to carry the message. For that, I am responsible. How you feel, if I hurt your feelings, ask any of the women, y'all can, the ladies put your, put your stuff in the chat. I do not care about your feelings. I'm gonna be nice, but I'm for sure gonna punch you in the face if I think you need that. Because people saved my life here not my feelings. And so with that, let's go. <laughs> so I want to I want to tell you I'm going to qualify according to the book. I'm going to talk about my experiences with the things that happen in the big book. I might linger a little bit on things I love in the book. There's some things I love. And after I walk you through my life um as it relates to Alcoholics Anonymous and as it relates to the God of my understanding and the incredible incredible profound experience that I had with Alcoholics Anonymous and with God and in the extraordinary life I have today. I want to tell you, don't feel sorry for me. I'm going to tell you some things that might make you be like, Jesus Christ, don't feel sorry for me. And if you leave feeling sorry for me, I would suggest that you do some reading and writing about why, because you're no better than me. I'm no better than you. All of us had a journey and my job today is to share mine. So, okay. Here, here's the traditional uh, qualification. They told me when I got here that it was to uncover, discover, and discard. So that's what I'm going to tell you. So when I got here, you know, it was, the, the lore is that my mother drank while pregnant with me, right? All of the stories that I heard were, oh, your mother in the bar. Oh, I remember when you, your mother was pregnant with you in the bar. You and your mom, your mom and I were out, right? Like I, my mother was an alcoholic. And so I think I got here not only born into a traumatic experience, but I think I was able to start drinking so young and drinking so much and drinking so hard because I'd been drinking. By the time I consciously picked up my first drink, I'd been drinking. So my mother abandoned me. She left me with some people when I was born. Um, my birthday is November 30th and in the middle of February, um, this woman returned me to my maternal family with a note saying, you know, the baby's great and the kids are great, but I can't afford to keep these kids. Like your, your sister didn't send money. And my mother was a hustler. And so I think she'd gotten arrested. And so she was unable to send money or come back and get me. And when I went to live with those people, they loved me and it created some stability for me, but I never got what the now neuroscience talks about is proper attachment. Like I never fully attached. And to this day, I really struggle with attachment. Like I'm really, really a hermit. Sharon is a stalker. And the only reason that I'm at this meeting or I do anything social is because Sharon makes me, right? Cause I'm left to my own devices. Like I'm gonna hang out alone. The truth is that I started getting sexually molested by my godfather who was a reverend um, pre-verbally. Right, so I'm a toddler, I'm an infant. And I go to my sister when I'm two years sober and I'm like, did he touch us? And she's like, oh my God, she's 11 years older than me. How did you know? And she starts explaining to me what he was doing to us. She's, uh, you know, she's 11, I'm a baby. She's 12, I'm one, she's 13, I'm two. And that's just my story, right? That's my story. And so what happens is by the time I'm, or my mom comes to get me, um, I'm shocked by who the hell are these people, right? Now, my aunt's in the project. She's a domestic. She doesn't have a lot of money. We have secondhand everything. You know what I mean? Everything is discount. 
but I go live with my mom. And then we're in the swank doorman building on the Upper West Side. And that's often what people aspire to. People come into the rooms and they're like, I can't wait till I have stuff. Well, I learned early on stuff wasn't good. Stuff didn't keep me safe. Having a doorman, having a marble lobby, living in a nice neighborhood, those things actually put me in more danger than I had been in the projects on the elevator with the piss in the middle of the floor. Anybody from the projects knows what I mean. So I'm going, I'm living with my mom. I'm about four. I don't think I'm five. My sister leaves for school. And my very first memory of being alone with my mother is that she's in the kitchen drinking a Schaefer beer and I'm in the kitchen with her and I ask if I can have some. And she says, sure. And I never remember alcohol being nasty. It was bubbly and it was fun. And the doorbell rang and she left me alone with that can of Schaefer beer and I polished it off. I finished it because that's what I am. I'm a finisher. If you put a drink down in front of me, I was going to finish. I was never a person to leave anything in the cup. And so that started really young. At eight years old, my mother is really full blown in her disease. Um, she had been running a prostitution ring and she meets a man and falls in love with him. He's a really lovely, lovely, lovely soul and human being. And she converts him to be a pimp so that she can retire. And then she's full time able to drink. And by the time I'm eight, it's the crazy show. The people who lived over us were our um, friends. And so my mom would send me upstairs with the water glass when she ran out of scotch. And I'd fill the water glass up and come back down. And I remember making a decision, like a few steps from the door, to drink what was in the glass. And I think I must have thought it was magic. Like here was a woman that, that had control over my life that was powerful. And she needed this medicine that was in the glass. And maybe if I had some, life wouldn't suck for me. And um, it worked. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, I drank and it was nasty and I threw up. And that's not my story. I drank. I fucking loved it. I love the effect. I love the taste. I loved it. A few years ago, I had to, um, I had to terminate somebody on a job. And, um, you know, I'm probably 29, 30 years sober. And I'm like, <sighs> and it was a smell that made me feel comfortable. And I finally figured out her ginger ale bottle was full of scotch. Classroom teacher, full of scotch, drunk in the room in front of the kids, right? But I could smell it. After 29 years, it gave me a sense of like, what's that? Yeah, that's what tore your life to the ground. That's what burnt it all up. So at 13, I am, um, I should say at eight, I started leaving home. I started going to adults and negotiating. Can I please come live with you? At 13, um, I'm back with my mom and I have a boyfriend who's 24. I'm going to let that sit there for a second. And none of the adults around me told me there was anything wrong with that. And wait for it. Ready? He's an alcoholic. What else could he be? And so it was the first time when I look back over my story that I can see that I always sought lower companionship. I always sought people that were worse off than me. You know, I joke about when I got to AA, I struggled with figuring out if I really belong here because I still had all my teeth. Because from where I came from, alcoholics didn't have their teeth. Alcoholics were homeless. Alcoholics had seizures, right? Alcoholics certainly, like my mother, pissed on themselves at the bar in the middle of the party in a ball gown. That was an alcoholic. But at 13, I had a boyfriend that, that was an alcoholic. He couldn't keep a job. He drank uh, Coke 45 day and night and... Um, I took to going around and begging the stores to please give us credit so that he and I could drink. At uh, about 14, I got sick. I was at my mom's house and, and I had really severe abdominal pains and the ambulance came and they took me to the hospital and I didn't know what was wrong. 
and I didn't have a great relationship with my mom and she had girlfriends that I was friends with or they were kind to me because I'd gone to them and begged them if I could live with them. And one came to the hospital and told me, my mother didn't visit, that um, I'd had an abortion and something had gone wrong, but I'd never been pregnant. Another woman told me that I had a venereal disease and uh, that's what the pain was. Um, and it turns out that she was telling the truth. That at 13 years old, a boy that was a man that was 24 years old gave me a sexually transmitted disease and sterilized me. Mm. Because alcoholics aren't the only people that suffer. We suffer, but so do our children. Children left unattended suffer. Bad things happen. You know, I was in elementary school and, and I was already drinking. I want to be clear. I was drinking. In eighth grade, my boyfriend was 24. I was drinking and smoking weed. But in elementary school, my, my curfew was 10 because there was a commercial that says it's 10 o'clock, you know where your kids are. And my mother thought that was the time your kids should come home. So there was no homework time or bedtime. Like I just didn't grow up like that. I grew up around pimps and prostitutes and hustlers and, and it was so much fun. Don't feel bad for me. My life was exciting. I came home from school. I never knew who was going to be living there. It was a ball. But the truth is that we pay for the party. We've all been to the party, but we all pay for the party. And I was lucky enough to start paying early because I was able to stop paying early. I came in at 26. Well, there was still a possibility for me. So there's a possibility for all of us. But for me, I got to have a whole life. I've now been sober longer than I drank. I've now been sober longer than I drank. So the truth is that it was a, a lot of abuse. It was a lot of searching for love outside myself, searching to take away the pain, searching for a sense of belonging, searching for stability. And those are my core issues, love, safety, and stability. Mm -hmm. And that's what alcohol gave me, love, safety, and stability. It just cost a lot. It just cost a lot. And it took me conscious contact with the God of my understanding to understand that all of the pain that I had suffered, all of the bad things that happened to me, helped me find what on page 77 tells me is my purpose. Page 77, four lines down, hidden in the big book, says our real purpose is to fit ourselves, fit, fit. I'm not on my own. They mean shape, conform, get into, fit, to fit myself to be of maximum use to God and those around me. So every horrible thing that's happened to me, every heartbreak has fit me to be of maximum service to God and those around me. For the people that I work with, what are they going to say to me that I'm going to be embarrassed about? What are they going to say to me that I'm going to have a judgment about, given what I've walked through? God prepared me to be of maximum service to him and those the people around me. So if you're new, welcome to a new way of life. If you've been around a while and you're fucking miserable right now, get to the book. Hit your knees because that misery is your portal to God. That misery is fitting you to be of maximum use. And so I now embrace the pain. I'm now grateful for the pain. So I want to talk about, because those are the, those are the, the, the those are the um, uncover parts, right? Uh, my AA hero, Ralph W. says that life is lived forwards and understood backwards. The things I've just told you about what it was like, I didn't understand any of that when it was happening. I understand that standing here, looking back and looking back, I can see what a gift, everything that happened to me, what it is. I mean, here's the truth and, and I'm going to move on. A few years ago, I realized that the sterilization was really a gift from God because when I got here and for many years after being here, I didn't have any self-esteem. I mean, you didn't know that. 
meeting me, but I didn't. And every man that smiled at me, I'd have had a baby for him. And I would have been my mother, a person unable to care for my own children. I would have continued the cycle. So God did for me what I couldn't do for myself. And for that, I am grateful. So what happens? You know, I do a geographic. Um, at 23, I leave New York and I, I moved to Oakland, California. Um, under the guise of, I was a, I was in a, on an academic track, on the guise of like continuing my education. But I really went there to drink and use without people bothering me. And Oakland was perfect place to do that. Oh my God, I had a ball. I really did, I had a ball. And of course I found lower companionship, right? I dated people and I hung around people and I lived with people who drank and used in a way that I could say, they need help. <laughs> right? That's what I did. They need help. So when I I hit my own bottom, my own spiritual bottom, and, and I'll say this about it. If you're here and you can't stand to be in your own skin. If your soul is on fire, if you can't figure out why nothing makes it better, not enough sex, not enough food, not enough booze, not enough shopping, not enough traveling, not enough gossiping, not enough talking about, if nothing makes it better, I suggest that you bend down and pick up the simple tool that are laid at your feet. They're simple tools. They're spiritual. And the book says when faced with the jumping off place, right? Go to the bitter end, trying to blot out the misery of my existence, right? Wanting to shoot ourselves in the head, wanting to jump out of the window or accept spiritual help. We actually are so sick that we are like, I don't know. But let me tell you, if you're suffering, bend down and pick them up. Because life is extraordinary on this road. Now, it gets worse. It got worse for me before it got better. Once you took alcohol away and I didn't have anything to cushion me and make me feel soft and cuddly, the book tells us this. I really didn't have untreated alcoholism. Because here's the thing. Alcohol was never my problem. Drugs were never my problem. That wasn't my problem. My problem was my mind. My problem was that I had a mind that told me that I was making decisions about my life and about drug use and about alcohol use. That was a lie. I couldn't trust my mind. That was my problem. My problem was once I started to drink, and use more. What's your drug of choice? More. That's my drug of choice. More. More, more, whatever it is, more. Let's try that. I wouldn't even ask people what it was. I'd be like, well, let's do that. That was my problem. Because I wasn't drunk when I picked up the first drink. My problem was my mind. And when it stopped working and I was left just with the misery I've been trying to avoid. Now, here's the trick. Ask yourself, does your drinking and using create problems that then make you want to drink and use? If so, you're in the right place. Because that's what it did for me. At 26, I finally surrender. I go to actually a therapist and the therapist tells me, she doesn't tell me I'm an alcoholic because I couldn't hear that. She told me that I should go to Al-Anon because, you know, after all, God knows I had suffered. My mother was an alcoholic. Life had been terrible. I was a victim, right? Bullshit. I was the tornado in my own life. And then she told me to not drink. Go try AA. It's down the block. Um, But don't drink for 90 days. If you drink, it's okay. It's okay. It's not a big deal. She told me it's a big deal. I'd have freaked out. I probably wouldn't have gone back. She said, if you drink, it's okay. Just start your count all over again and pay attention, right? This is, this is where we get fucked up. Pay attention to how long it takes. 
So if you think that you're an alcoholic, let me, if you think you're not an alcoholic, let me give you a gift. If you're an alcoholic, you shouldn't drink. And if you're not an alcoholic, then not drinking should be easy. And it wasn't. It took me a while to put together that little funky 90 days. And I had all the reasons because I have the mind of an alcoholic. Oh, I, I didn't mean I wasn't going to drink starting today. Like it's my girl's birthday. We got to go out. Oh, I didn't mean that I wasn't going to not drink now. I mean, I, I still got liquor. Let me just finish this bottle. Oh, I didn't mean I wasn't going to get high now. I mean, yeah, I said that, but I didn't really mean that. I wasn't thinking clearly. Tomorrow's better. Next week is better. See, that's the mind of an alcoholic. That you actually believe you're making a decision. You're not making a decision. Your disease is making a decision. And it does it when you're not drinking. So it's not the alcohol. It's your mind. And that was my story. Um... Early recovery was rough. Surrender was rough. I'd already done a geographic and here I was surrendering. I didn't have any family. The only friends I had were um, active alcoholics and addicts like me. And I had to build a whole new life. Um, and I built it in the rooms. I built it in the fellowship. I was maybe, I don't know, certainly less than a year sober, probably a couple months sober and some old timers told me that I needed to do hospital and institution work. And that the people who did H&I work never drank again. And I was early enough in that I was afraid to drink still. And so I did H&I service. And I wanna talk about what H&I service did for me. Um, it certainly helped me find a different level of connection to the God of my understanding. I was always at meetings looking for, for um, people I could kidnap, hostages that I could take to H&I meetings, right? Because I, I didn't always know what to say and I'd said it all, right? It also had me with a trunk full of literature all the time because when you go to the hospital and institution meetings, there's free literature out. You just take it and you put it in your car and you take it to the meetings you go to. At least that's how it was when, when I got sober. And I always had literature and I often had a hostage I was taken to a meeting. And it put me in a position where when I didn't know what to talk about in a meeting, I just opened the book. I just read the book. I never thought that recovery was in the 12 and 12. Thank God nobody told me that. I never thought it was in living sober. I always was taught that recovery was in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I'd get to these treatment centers and I hadn't gone to treatment. And some of the women didn't have their teeth. Remember, that was my gauge for like where I was on the scale. And so I would read the book. And reading the book helped me see myself. Initially, I wasn't Bill. I certainly, uh, to this day, you can't tell me I'm the jaywalker, right? But as I read the book, I realized I am Bill. Grandiose. I'm going to run something. No, I'm only going to run my mouth. And I should be careful how I do that. I was going to explain to people that I'm having the greatest thoughts of my life while loaded. I, I don't know about anybody else, but do you remember being high and being like, oh my God, this is so profound. No, it's not. <laughs> You're high. It actually doesn't even make sense. I would write stuff down while I was high and go back and read it and be like, well, that don't make no sense. But in my mind, right, I'm Bill. I think I'm having some great philo philosophical thought. No, I'm not. I'm burning my life to the ground and I don't know that. I want to talk about um, my recovery because I think that's the, the more important part, right? Active in AA, great. Get a sponsor, you know, for the new people. Here are the six things I think you need. I think you need a sobriety date, get it, love it, hold on to it. Mine is May 21st, 1987. There is no separating me from that date. Tyler came and spoke at the, the Bronx Big Book for us and Tyler said, the thing that you put your time and energy and effort into, that's what you worship. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's what you worship. So I my, my sobriety date, I put time and energy and effort into that. 
into that. I have a bunch of, bunch of, bunch of coins for all of the years that I've been sober. And if I've got two of the same coin, it's not because I gave up my date. It's because I went to more than one meeting and got a coin. So the six things I think you need as a newcomer is, is you need a sobriety date, right? I needed that. I needed something to anchor me between the life I had and the life I was about to have. And that's what I think of my date as. It's an anchor. It anchors me at the beginning of a new journey. Um, I needed a home group. I needed a group of people who knew me and saw me. And, you know, AA has not been perfect for me. I was, I was, uh, I had two home groups. I had a, a rap at noon that met on Monday through Friday at noon and a, a Sunday step discussion. And a guy that was a member of both of the home groups came up to me when I was nine years sober and told me that all the men in the fellowship that were my friends, they were my friends because they wanted to fuck me. And I was so devastated by that. A way he said it, the earnestness of his conviction in saying it, that I, um, I was in the middle of a move to Staten Island and I just never went back to AA. It took me four years maybe to consistently come back, to pick another home group, to join you again. Because remember, my core issues are love, safety, and stability. And it didn't feel safe. So while I'm telling you what the six things are, I'm gonna tell you when you get a home group, it's not Wellness Anonymous, and people are gonna say and do some shit that's not okay. And do not let them run you out of the fellowship. Do not let them take your home group. Fuck them, because it's not Wellness Anonymous. The other thing you need is a sponsor. I really struggle with sponsorship over the years because I'm so fucking smart, right? Um, the last sponsor I had, I, I said some stuff about my life, and she was like, oh, my. And, like, I haven't been really comfortable with her since, and, you know, I really am working on it. There are a couple people I want to stalk, and, and I want to ask them, and, and I really am working on it because I need more than the, the contact that I have. Um, the fourth thing that you need is you need a service commitment and I don't care what that is. I don't care if your service commitment starts with every day I put 50 cents in the basket and at the end of the week I put in 350. I, I don't care. Commit yourself to something to contribute to the whole. Make a commitment. Get to the meeting early. Say hello to people. Take people's numbers down and just text them hi. I'm from the Bronx Big Book. I'm from whatever meeting. I call to say hello. How are you today? Because you never know when that small thing that you do will be a blessing in somebody's life. Maybe they're sitting on the side of the bed wanting to blow their brains out. What are you doing to contribute? Stop. The book tells us this. Stop taking. Stop being selfish. The question is not what we can do for you. What can you do for us? That's what the book tells me. What can I contribute? I think I'm all five. I think the fifth thing that we need um, is sponsees. Man, find somebody to help. Find somebody to help. Sponsorship is my least favorite form of service. I have seven women. And I don't want to. But... I bet you if you ask them, they don't think that, right? Because it doesn't matter what I want. What I want tore my life to the ground. What I want tore me to the ground. So how about do what I'm told? How about obedience? Let me let me move on because I, I feel like I'm, I'm lecturing and that's certainly not my intent. So... What I did when I left regular attendance at AA and really being a part of the fellowship, because I really am today a three legacy person. I really am unity, recovery, and service. But when I left those years that I was in and out of meetings, um, I tried to fill the hole in my life with love. I met a guy everybody wanted. I didn't want him, but everybody wanted him. But everybody wanted him. So I was like, okay. And it was perfect on the outside, right? But it wasn't perfect on the inside. And so I tried to fill the space that got created by leaving you with him. 
But when I left you, I left my spiritual practice and my spiritual practice takes me to God. And what the book tells me is no human power. So he couldn't fill the hole. No trips to Florence, no, nothing. Nothing could fill the hole. And ultimately I wasn't good enough and he wasn't good enough and it wasn't good enough and I had to go. And that brought me to enough pain that I came back to you. And I came back to the fellowship and I came back to service. And so you don't have to do that. Learn from my pain. If you drift away, the farther away you get from the fellowship, the more open to pain and suffering you are without a solution. I mean, I pay, I have pain and suffering now, right? But I have a solution. It's my portal to God. I know how to hit my knees. I know how to practice. I mean, it's, it's, it's practice. Practice makes never perfect, but practice makes it easy. By the time I, um, I left him, I, I had a great career. And so then he didn't work. So then I could actually lightweight come to AA, right? I had a home group. I lightweight went to AA. I didn't sponsor anybody, but I did service. You know, I'll be the literature person. I'll be the treasurer, stuff that doesn't like require I be there all the time, right? The, the hiding, what I call a hiding service positions. Um, I did those. And then I got this career that allowed me truly, truly to be of service to God and those about me. Truly, truly. No bullshit. Really, really honest to God of service to God and the people about me. The problem is I wasn't getting fed. I was feeding. And then I got confused about who I was. Oh, I was God. I was the decision maker. I was in the driver's seat. I was, and you know what? That didn't work either. That didn't work either. Because I found out that after a while, I was an empty shell. I didn't have anything. The book tells us, Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who suffers. But obviously, right? Obviously. wasn't obvious to me. Obviously, you can't transmit what you haven't got. So the reason that I still come here is because I have to keep filling myself up with stuff to give you. I have to keep filling myself up so that I have something to give. Otherwise, you know what I'm sharing? My disease. That's what I'm sharing. When you call me, I'll share my disease. I'll say this before I move on. Um, the gift of time, right? There are people who have less time than me that I think work a better program. I think they're more serene. I think that their conscious contact is like, wow. Um, I'd name them, but they'd be mad at me if I did. And then there are people who I'm like, I don't want what you got. <laughs> I don't want what you got. So there are two things to remember. I don't know where you started, so I'm not in a position to judge where you are. I don't know where you started. So I don't know how far you've come. And wherever you are, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Now, I get to love everybody in the fellowship. But I get to decide who I'm friends with. I get to decide that, right? Free will that God gave me. But I have to love all of you. So when you injure me, when you treat me in a way that I don't want to be treated, it's a reminder to me to stop and look at myself. I talked to... Um, to a member of the fellowship that I really, really like yesterday. And I said, you know, I'm really struggling with this thing with somebody else in the fellowship. They said something and it really disturbed my spirit. Like it felt racist and it really, it disturbed me. And I, I if, even at 33 years, like, I don't know, like, is it none of my business or do I say something or right? And, um, you know, I've prayed a lot about this question. And she was like, well, did you write about it? And I was like, I want to hang up on you. No, I ain't write about it. But that's always the answer. Did I write about it? Because when I put it on paper, I can see myself more clearly. Well, let me talk about, there are a couple things I want to talk about. and I, I think this has been a rambling mess. But let me, let me tell you a couple things about the, the paradox of my life. 
So when I got here, and, and these are my parting gifts to you, right? The, the practice, the principles in all of my affairs. When I got here, they told me I had a threefold disease. I had a disease of my mind, and my mind was going to lie to me. That's the disease of my mind. My mind is going to lie to me. Peter M. says, when you get here and like you find God, people are like, oh, you're out of your mind. And he says, thank God you're out of your mind. You should try to stay out of your mind. Yeah, it's a disease of my mind. I cannot trust what my mind tells me. That's the alcoholism. It says I have a disease of my body. If I put one in, I'm off to the racist. You know what scared me when I got here? The 30-year-old the in the beginning of the book. He makes a decision that, oh my God, I need to stop drinking. And he stops drinking, he doesn't drink for 25 years. And at 55, he retires, and inside four years, the carpet slipper dude, the carpet slipper dude, scared to death of the carpet slipper dude. Because my mind tells me today, 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 you could drink today. But what I know is I have a threefold disease. If I put it in my body, I'm off to the races. I'll shoot drugs. I know that about me. Fuck around with drinking alone. I'm going all the way. And I know that because I have a threefold disease. Here's the irony. Only a spiritual solution will help me fix those two things. People get here and they want to fix the practical stuff. My child support, my parking tickets, my, right? No. And, and, they, and they think we're crazy. It's the spiritual work that fixes the other stuff. But I have a spiritual malady. I'm sick spiritually. So how do I have a sick spirit fix a sick mind and a sick body? I surrender. I surrender. That walk, right? We talked about it the other night. The walk from the driver's seat to the passenger seat. Here's the joke. I always been in a European car. I only thought I was in the driver's seat. The steering wheel ain't never been on my side, ever. 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 So the paradox is that I need to have my sick spirit help me fix my sick, fix my sick mind and my sick body. And I can do that when I come in and I admit the paradox. I find power by admitting that I'm powerless. I find power by admitting, it tells, tells us powerless. Powerlessness, we think that, that that's, that's the problem. So let us help you find power. And we think, when I got here, I thought it meant, I'm going to learn how to manage my own life. I'm going to learn how to make good decisions, pick better friends, have a better career, have my... No, it didn't mean that. It meant that I actually can't trust myself to make any good decisions, and I need to go to God with all of it. The paradox is that my sick spirit needs to be healed in order to fix my sick mind and my sick body. And that the only way to do that is to say that I don't have power in order to have the power I need to fix the things that are wrong with me. What are you saying? That doesn't make any sense. Guess what? It works. So here are the two things I want to, I want to share as I wind down, um, because I am who I am, my, and I, my experience, my experience, my experience, my experience, I'm still who I was when I got here. And when I got here, the things that happened to me, the, a, sure, a parade, a parade of people sexually molested me a parade that had an impact on me. I'm still that person. I'm no longer suffering from it blindly. I now get to see what it did to me and make decisions about if I'm gonna participate in the crazy that it gave me. Let, let me say that again for you. All the things that happened to me fit me to be of maximum service to God and those around me. 
it gave me some some scars and some dips and some twists that helped me be perfect for another crazy alcoholic that has suffered like I've suffered. I'm perfect for you if you're crazy. I'm crazy. I don't have a, a feeling or a judgment about your crazy. Let me show you mine. But you can still recover. And so I still have the crazy I had when I got here. I just can see it and I can surrender it and I can make decisions about whether or not it runs my life today. That's what I can do. I'm not gonna tell you in 33 years, the, the heavens opened and the angels sang, and when the book says I'm reborn, it doesn't mean I'm a new person. It means I act new, I have a new attitude, I have a new outlook, I have a new approach, I have a new job. And my job, page 77, Four sentences down, maximum service to, to God and the people around me. And that's a lot of work. It takes away the time I have to be crazy about me, right? So this core stuff I came in with, I don't believe that I'm good enough to be loved. I don't feel safe. People are going to hurt me. Shit's not stable. I lived nine places by the time I was 10. Hell, I've moved eight times since 2010. Stable, I'm not stable. Not only physically am I not stable, I'm not so sure I'm stable mentally or emotionally. But I surrender and I surrender and I surrender and I surrender and I seek God. And so this bondage, I was having a conversation um, the other day um, with Elaine, who I love. And I wanna just say this to the women who've come to me and said, will you help me? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for letting me be of service to you because as working with others says, it's service to me. So we're having this conversation about bondage, right? Bondage of self. Third step prayer doesn't say, God, remove me from drinking and drugs, right? That's not what it says. It says, remove me from the bondage of self. Why? Because the alcoholism is the problem, not the alcohol. It doesn't say remove alcohol because alcohol is not the problem. The problem is the alcoholism in my mind. And so bondage of self, right? They don't like me. They're talking about me. I didn't get the promotion. Uh, I think he's cheating. He what, Whatever, right? All the crazy, the crazy. They, they're whatever. They didn't invite me to the party. What? The crazy. You know the crazy. Y'all know the crazy. Don't pretend you don't know the crazy. You know the damn crazy. And that's the bondage. You want to know what they mean, the bondage? That's the bondage. The crazy in your head, that's the bondage. So the bondage actually... When you're in for a while, you get to see if you do the work that the bondage of self is another paradox. Me being bonded to myself and in my crazy mind, I think, well, I'm paying attention to myself because I'm trying to take care of myself because I need to fill in the blank. I need to meet my own needs, right? I need to do footwork. I need to, I need to, I need to, for me, ah, the bondage. What the bondage of self does it prevents me from being present for my own life. The bondage of self, the thing I do that I think keeps me alive, keeps me from being alive in my own life. See, here's the, here's the crazy thing. Here's the ride, guys, ready? I don't feel good enough. So because I don't feel good enough, I'm gonna construct a person, a representative, that looks good enough so that you'll think I'm good enough. And then that person is always in motion because I need to keep them moving or you'll see it's not really me. I got to move from place to place. I got to move from people to people. I got to keep doing stuff, right? Why? Because I'm hiding that I don't feel good enough. In 33 years sober, I'm like, no, nah, I don't need to go to the party. No, I don't need to go out. Nope, I don't need to do that because now I finally have a little relief. 
And the little relief is, I don't need to be good enough no more. Fuck it. This is what I am. But in the bondage, I'm always not feeling good enough. And I'm always constructing a representative. And I'm always working for it. I'm not a human being. I'm a human doing. I could do that. I could do that. I could do that. that that's the bondage of self. And then I'm unavailable for my own life. Why am I unavailable? Because I'm worried about you. Because my representative is a full-time job. How am I going to be in my life? I'm busy being the representative. Bondage of self. Bondage of self. And then I say, hey, God, when the lights are off and it's just me, I'm not, I'm not getting my needs met. And then God laughs at me because God's given me everything I need to have my needs met. But I'm squandering that energy on some shit that doesn't matter because guess what? What you think of me is none of my business. It actually doesn't matter. Here's a promise. When I lay down to die, I'm probably not going to remember none of y'all. None personal. How important really is it? Bondage of self. Bondage of self. Do I look good enough? Do I act good enough? Do I sound good enough, right? I haven't done a speaker meeting in decades because I duck. I'm not doing that shit. If Matt had asked me, I'd have said no. He didn't ask me. So I was like, oh, fuck, man, an hour? Because I don't really want to. Because then I've got a trigger, like the door opens and crazy comes out. Oh, my God, I got to walk them through all 12 steps. Oh, my God, I got to be profound. Oh, my God. No, I don't. I'm going to show up and share my story because that's what I got. And you know what that is? Perfect. It's perfect. Because it's all I got. And I know it's perfect because God gave it to me. So I'm gonna I'm gonna end on this because I'm I'm out of time. Um, when I look at what it is that the rest of my life holds, you know, I'm born to an alcoholic. My mother was orphaned as a kid, and she's a hustler, a sporting woman. I grew up around pimps and prostitutes and hoes. I start drinking at five. I'm drinking scotch at eight. I'm in the bars at 13. I'm sterilized by a grown man at 13. It's a shit show. It's a shit. It's a fucking horror movie. And guess what happens? I find AA. Who knew that was a blessing? And I find 12 simple spiritual tools that I struggle to do. I am powerless. My life, the ABCs, the paragraph above the ABCs and how it works says, you know, all the steps, blah, 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 blah. Three pertinent ideas, three, three pertinent ideas, three ideas you need to know about. A, your life is unmanageable. Two, no human power. Three, God could and would. And here's my favorite book and word in the big book. If. Go search all the ifs in the big book. If. If. God's love isn't conditional. But this path of surrender and serenity and recovery is conditional. If. If. Now, it says before and after. And the question is before and after what? Before and after. I got here. My life is still unmanageable today. So yeah, it was a shit show. And yeah, I found AA, thank God. But my life is still unmanageable. And so if it weren't, and if I was recovered from crazy, because I'm recovered from drinking, if I was recovered from crazy, if I was cured from alcoholism, I, I wouldn't have any defects. I'd be perfect. I'd be God. Why would I need you guys? But God keeps me bumping my head and suffering so I can keep surrendering. And every time I surrender, I find another 
not only opportunity to be of service to you, but another way to see the things that have happened to me as blessings, to see the things that I used to think were deficits, curses, that I was abandoned by God as truly the doorway to freedom, the doorway to joy, the doorway to happiness. At 59, I'll be 60 November 30th, my life is extraordinary. It's extraordinary. It's, wow. And so if you are new or if you've been here a while and you're struggling, I promise you, I swear to the God of my understanding that if you surrender to the simple steps, if you walk through the program, the design for living outlined in the book, that joyous, happy, and free, and the 250 promises in the big book are yours. I love you guys. I hope that um, I said something that's meaningful. Thank you for letting me be a part of your life. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.